Uh, welcome back to Keeping the World Company. I'm Jay Fidel. We're going to talk about an update on Israel's war against Hamas um, with uh, uh, Gene Rosenfeld and my co-host uh, Tim Apicello. We're going to follow up on our discussion last week because an awful lot has happened. Joe Biden went for a day, came back, tried to mm, keep things cool. Um, but uh, today there's more rockets, there's more air attacks. Um, there's a, a story of a, of some drones and missiles in the Red Sea that were shot down by an American destroyer, possibly heading toward Israel, probably, in my view, heading toward Israel. And there's um, increased um, violence uh, around the Arab world, um, possibly um, likely uh, related to the narrative that was uh, put out by Hamas after the hospital explosion. Um, even though it's pretty clear um, that the hospital explosion was by the uh, by the, uh, uh, the jihad, not not by the Israelis. Okay, so let's get updated here. Tim, you go first. What what are the significant events this week? Well, I'm going to go right to where your introduction went and uh, quote Mark Twain: uh, "A lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth is still putting on its shoes." And as before we, we came onto this show, uh, Gene correctly said, it's, it's all about the narrative. And if you can capture the narrative and, 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 and keep throwing it down and, and repeating it, uh, that becomes the new accepted truth, regardless of what the truth eventually becomes. And as of this morning, uh, about 10 minutes ago, CNN just reported that U.S. intelligence agencies have confirmed that this missile that hit that hospital um, is definitely was from the Islamic Jihad. I mean, it did not come from Israel. And uh, so that's the truth. Yet now we have, um, as, a, as a result of what I call suspect reporting and, and um, made assumptions, uh, we had reporting that has canceled a, a cri critical meeting in the Middle East with Jordan and Egypt with President Biden. Uh, that meeting was canceled as a result of those stories. And uh, mission half accomplished. Uh, his trip there was half accomplished, and uh, it should have been 100% accomplished. So that's an update, is that this, this false narrative put out by Hamas that 432 people were killed. The estimate now is somewhere between 100 and 200 individuals, still 100 and 200 too many. Uh, but it wasn't Israel that bombed a hospital. And, and Israel wouldn't bomb a hospital on purpose. They just wouldn't do it. But uh, there you go. There's the narrative. And, and Gene's spot on again is that... Um, it's not the truth is never the important part is is how you can just repeat a lie and as an all good propaganda repeat it and repeat it and get it out there first and that's what happened in this case yeah indeed um you know and and uh, the number of people who were injured or killed uh, in the hospital parking lot hospital itself was not blown up it was only the parking lot um you know keeps changing and, it, you know, it goes to the question of whether Hamas has ever been telling the truth about the number of people or inflating that number. I noticed also an Israeli analysis of the footage that they've been playing out, that Hamas have been playing out to the world. And uh, the Israeli analysis shows that a good part of that footage is made up. It has nothing to do with now or Gaza or the Israelis uh, or Hamas. They just grabbed it elsewhere. And been telling everyone that it it, uh, it reflects what happened in in Gaza. Interesting, you know. Yeah. Let me interrupt here. You know, we've talked about the role of the media for a lot of issues, particularly reporting on Donald Trump. Uh, at what point does the media have to look at their sources and say, to what degree of suspicion shall we hold before we put it on the front page or uh, as a leading news item on CNN or MSNBC? I have no answer to that, but I hope it comes soon. Um, in any event, uh, let, let me go to Gene. And Gene, you mentioned before the show that it really didn't matter uh, what actually happened at the hospital. Uh, what counts um, is, is, is the narrative. Can you talk about that? Well, first of all, it does matter that people were killed and injured and they were innocents and civilians. And it's very interesting to look at the traditions in Islam and Judaism over <clears throat> whether civilian um, casualties are acceptable under the rules of war. There are different rules of war in Islam and Judaism. 
So that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> what I meant by that is that the stories we tell ourselves um, motivate our behavior and our attitudes. And we're emotional beings before we're thinking beings. So our emotions rule at times of great crisis and drama. And so what happens in history then becomes a function of that rather than the logical information we can gather about any given thing. History takes place after the event. That's when we re reflect and our emotions die down and there's a tranquil period in which we can take a reckoning. And after wars, this is what happens. And sometimes we have courts and reconciliation committees and else, but not during the time when things are happening. They're just happening too fast. And as they say, the history of the event is told by the survivors. Yes and no. You have revisionists in history. That's history is sort of like science. In fact, what I do is a social science. It's qualitative analysis. And after the fact, somebody will write something, put a theory together. It'll sound very logical. And then somebody will investigate their sources and go back over it, get new sources, and then come back with a revised idea in history. This is why we have Confederate flags disappearing from the American South, because the narrative was that it was all states' rights that caused the Civil War and freedom for the South. In fact, they've suppressed the true facts, which was it was about slavery. Mm -hmm. But it took 100 years, almost, not quite, uh, 75 years, let's say, for that to become, to replace the dominant narrative. So you see how fast a narrative and the stories we tell ourselves becomes more important than what we put together in a cool, logical fashion. You know, you were also mentioning before the show that, um, you know, the press doesn't want to talk about controversial things, doesn't want to publish articles that mm, talk about controversial things. What is the media doing on this? We're in day 13 now, and I'm wondering how you feel the media has done in terms of reporting the things the way they happen. Well, that's a big word, the media. I guess the media are the major outlets that people listen to on television, on their, um, uh, on their screens, uh, which includes print media, New York Times, Washington Post, largely The Guardian, uh, in, in, the, in the Western world anyway. Um, in general, they're governed by very strong canons of journalism. They're their uh, objective is, is to uh, gather information, but information must be carefully uh, confirmed by their own organizations. And NBC did a very good job of this, for example, when it uh, came up with actual documents from dead jihadi terrorists in kibbutzes and found in their pockets, they found maps of schools and school cafeterias and residences and in these kibbutzes where they were to go and take hostages. They were given these instructions in Arabic and it's very, very detailed. And they came out with that. And, and that's what they do best. What they do worst is everyone is invested in this one way or another emotionally. And we don't realize the extent to which our preconceived notions determine what we select to present. Thirdly, we're going through a period in the United States where discussion is being censored. It's being censored on many different levels. I mean, the Republicans have a point when they talk about uh, school campuses where certain discussions can't take place in class or people report on other people. That is chilling. And Stanford, for example, has a whole new uh, <clears throat> initiative now to uh, increase uh, the freedom of speech on campuses. So we have to be, be careful because the media is very, very, there's no more controversial subject than religion and war. And the media is also in a sense, preventing some ideas from coming out because they're too controversial, I believe. Um, I'm pretty careful about what I write and I document it. And I sent in a couple little essays recently to our local newspaper, and which normally print 
<laughs> fortunately, I'm very happy with them, what I write. And I didn't get any responses. And I figured, oh my, you know, it's just too too hot a potato right now. That's too bad because you're a scholar. <laughs> and what you write is going to be important for public consumption. In this in this climate, uh, a laboratory scientist's conclusion is equivalent to an influencer's opinion. <laughs> you know, the kind of, of knowledge and the epidemic of ignorance in our country is is you can track it with the rise of the internet. Where does uh, religion play in in this war now? Um, you know, you've been writing about religion and terrorism for a long time. Where does it play? And and you did write an article about that. What, can you talk about it? Which oh, which, the the one on uh, religious confrontations play by different rules. Yes. Yes. Okay. I went back to an experience I had in 1996 when I was called by the FBI to give them an interpretation of what a hostile person said inside of a farmhouse that was ringed by FBI people and was holding, quote, hostages. And um, in that experience, which took place with two of my colleagues, I, after that, I wrote an analysis of the whole thing. But it ended peacefully, and it ended peacefully because uh, the FBI employed novel methods of resolving it and didn't listen to the clamor of the press and the population of go in there with guns blazing. That was an 81 day standoff. It was the Freeman standoff in Jordan, Montana. And it took, uh, what we did is we employed different, different, uh, things. And, and one of the most important things that the FBI did differently is that they gave the ultimate say in how to handle things on a daily basis to their negotiators, not to their hostage rescue team, which is military basically paramilitary. So what happened at Waco is they gave uh, they gave more power to the field commanders who reversed the uh, agreement that they had made uh, as to how they were going to handle things at the end, and there was a bloodbath. And so scholars came in, and, and the FBI consulted with scholars, and eventually they did some self-analysis, and they did things differently. So I took the principles that I learned from that and the analysis I wrote up, and I applied them to this situation under a Jewish logical rule called Kal the Homer, which means what obtains in the smaller case may obtain in the larger case. So you have a smaller case of a confrontation with a religious group in Montana. The principles that guide the peaceful resolution of that may have something to say about what applies in the larger case of a religious war in Israel. So uh, I just wrote about that. And as a result of that, I said, and this happens to agree with Jewish rules of just war, by the way, that before you go in to lay siege to a city, you have to initiate negotiations. And we all know that the principles of negotiations are governed by what happens on the ground in any kind of a hot conflict. So it's probably best to open up an avenue for negotiations, even if the parties don't yet want to sit down. And I think that's what Blinken did when he went to Qatar, because Qatar is the logical place uh, mediator in this before you uh, go in with guns blazing and the longer you take time I said is on Israel's side the the power that's doing the sieging can determine how long it's going to take and and what steps it's going to take so that is in accord also with Jewish just war principles and if if you have a minute I'll just lay out the four principles that I got from Margot Kitt's book on religion and war, and that is on laying siege to a city. Um, you have to determine first, can it be captured without destroying it? Secondly, negotiations must precede any subjugating of the city to hunger, thirst, or disease. So that's an important principle in this case. Three, you have to send emissaries of peace for three days before you lay siege. That would be equivalent to approaching Qatar and saying, would you please talk to Hamas, some of whose leaders are actually in your country, and see if we can establish a, a, a track of negotiation parallel with the track of the military. And four, a side to the city must be left open as an escape route. Now, that you might apply that to Israel's attempt to tell the uh, Palestinians they had to go south. 
There are complicating factors of that that don't work too well. Um, but those are the, the main four rules. There's nothing approaching that in Islam, I must say. Hmm. So um, let me let me turn it to Tim for a minute and taking those four principles and, you know, everything we know, including what we know about the way Hamas uh, operates and the fact uh, of the massacre and the fact that they have a few hundred um, hostages. You think it would work? You know, actually, Gene makes a great point is that time does help uh, because Israelis, uh, Americans, we're, we're emotional. Everyone's emotional. Uh, that's the human condition. And when Joe Biden said yesterday, um, he compared our, our experience with the 9-11 and he understood, you know, the need for justice, the need for immediate justice. Uh, but he also said in the same sentence almost is that um, mistakes were made as we as we dished out justice as a result of the 9-11 attacks. And I think that was a very controversial thing for him to do, but he did it. And I'm glad he did it because it was to say to Israel and the world at the same time, at the same podium microphone, that uh, let's not be hasty and let's not get into something that you're going to regret and can't extricate yourself out of. Um, I think he's referring into, uh, you know, uh, boots on the ground invasion. So, yeah, I think it does work. And I think these four rules are, are very, very wise for us to keep in mind. And um, hopefully the American public also has that in mind as before we blunder into our next military conflict. Hmm. I, I'm sorry, Gene, I wanted to pose it to Tim, but I also want to pose it to you. Would those four rules work? And and what gloss would you put on them? You know, what did details would you modify to make it more likely they would work? Well, you know, I'm I'm not a lone voice here. Tom Friedman wrote a wonderful column a few days ago in the New York Times, and other uh, columnists have have also echoed this that um, going into Gaza and executing urban warfare um, is not something that should proceed um, without determining whether you can handle that um, and isolate the 30,000 Hamas members from the uh, <clears throat> 2 million Gazans that are there. It, these people are hostages in a way. They, because the rules that the, the jihadists play by are different even from the rules in classical Islam. They have their own rules based on a, uh, a scholar named Ibn Tamaya in the 1200s that Al-Qaeda privileges about. Um, it, you know, they'll make martyrs of anybody. Martyrdom is, is held in very high esteem. And they will basically not take cognizance of the impact on their own civilian population. Yes, what they're aiming for is the victory of their version of Islam, which is very puritanical, over and above um, any other governing power or any other identity. And even those that are Muslims that side with the non-Muslims are considered fair game they're just as bad. So it's a very stark polarization between those that are on your side and the rest of the world. So th that the ends then justify the means, but martyrdom becomes a, a desired almost outcome. And the fact is that the people are, are the sea in which the terrorists are swimming. And I don't see how um, Israel can possibly go into uh, Gaza City while there are one million civilians there hold up. They have to take care of those people in the South first. So negotiation has to also take place. It's not impossible to negotiate with any entity if you take into consideration what their ultimate objectives are and you are willing to give up something that is valuable to them. Well, I remind you that uh, Golda Meir had a lot of good quotes, and one of them was, uh, you, you can't negotiate for peace with someone who has 
committed to destroy and kill you. Um, she said that way back when. And I, I really wonder uh, if this uh, the, the four rules will work. Um, to separate the 30,000 uh, Hamas from the 2 million ordinary workaday, although there are not a lot of jobs in Gaza, uh, the ordinary mm, Palestinians in Gaza, um, that's pretty hard. And uh, Hamas is not going to easily agree to that. So these negotiations uh, would have to result in some kind of separation between those who are committed to killing Israelis um, and the ordinary people. Um, and since Hamas has the guns uh, and is already using them in many, many ways as human shields, why would Hamas ever negotiate a kindly result there? Because they've already set forth their conditions. They have conditions that are not acceptable to the Israelis, but they have conditions. That is always mm -hmm. a starting point. Secondly, what happens on the ground influences the negotiations. Negotiations should precede what happens on the ground. That's why the Israelis need to hold back. Not only that, thirdly, if they go in under these conditions now, they will suffer higher casualties on their own forces because urban warfare is the absolute worst type of warfare. And military commanders will tell you that. Thirdly, they're going to lose the hostages because they will be the consequence of be a purely military um, uh, initiative. So it has to be, it has to go on a two track. Thing, and time is on the Israeli side. They're the ones that control the time factor. And we found in this smaller case of a religious confrontation, it made all the difference in the outcome. If you if you compare Waco and its consequence of Oklahoma City, which you can kind of extrapolate to the consequence on world opinion vis-a-vis -vis Israel and these outbursts vis-a-vis -vis Israel, if you compare that with the Freeman crisis and what happened there. Now, you can't always guarantee that these principles will work, but we have some evidence that they do work. Yeah, I'd like to add maybe a, a subset or a fourth point to Gene's uh, previous points, and that is urban warfare. Um, all we have to do is go back in history and look at the siege of Stalingrad and uh, how the buildings that were decimated, which Israel is doing right now, became the perfect hiding place for all, all, the, uh, all the Russians and the Germans to hide behind. And so the casualty rate went exponentially higher because um, you didn't have an open you know, playground of, of, of the field of battle. And so uh, if, if Israel goes in with, with ground troops, uh, it's gonna be a hard bloody slog. And I think Israel will, will sustain a lot of casualties trying to root out uh, Hamas fighters. Nobody will disagree with that. Nobody will disagree um, that it's not a bad idea to, to try mediation, uh, to try negotiation before um, any further action. But query, Gene, what, what are the conditions that Hamas laid out? And how far are they from, you know, the reality of an, an agreeable solution? Well, they're very far from the reality of a solution, but that's how things always start out. I mean, we negotiated with the North Koreans to uh, put a ceasefire in place for the Korean War. We negotiated with the Vietnamese. We've negotiated with some pretty hard uh, individuals. And it, whether you get a cessation of hostilities, whether you get a different objective from an end to the war, still you 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 aim for a better a, a better outcome. And <clears throat> The, one of the conditions is for uh, the release of the hostages, they want every single Palestinian hostage released. 7,000. From, from Israeli jails, yes. That's number one uh, that they want. Uh, secondly, they don't want to be rooted out of power. They want to be left alone and, and not punished for what they've done. Um, those are the two uh, initial uh, objectives. And they threatened if that isn't the case, then they will involve their other allies in a multi-front war with Israel. The narrative will proceed. Now, I said time is on the Israeli side, but time also governs the narrative that goes around the world. And especially in the Middle East, which is a tinderbox that we don't want to have explode. That has implications for what's happening with China and Russia, who in the meantime right now are meeting to for their outreach to the unaligned world to replace 
the American hegemony, the, the Pax Americana that's in the world. So things are happening on a global stage as well that can be affected by this hot war. I see these things as all connected, and that's another essay that I wrote, and it's also, I've talked about it on this program. We have to bear in mind all the dots connect one way or another. And if you, if a butterfly, you know, moves its wings here, it's going to result in some sort of calamity there. Hmm. So, uh, Tim, one of the things that uh, that uh, Jean suggested is, is we have to look, Israel has, to, however this works out, uh, let's assume for this discussion that the four points apply, that there is a negotiated result along the lines that she has just described somewhere in the middle of the two positions that somehow would 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 result in a peace. Um, but she has also suggested that Israel has to be very careful about the security of its borders, more careful perhaps than Netanyahu has been recently. Um, so query, how in the world can Israel prevent this from happening again? Assuming all that, how can it secure its borders in a way to avoid a repetition? Oh, boy. Uh, that's a tough question, Jay, because we all know that walls don't work. <laughs> Be it the wall of trying to separate Mexico from uh, southern United States, or in this case, uh, an, an impenetrable wall uh, between um, you know, the Gaza area and Israel. Uh, walls are they're permeable, and there's ways of getting around it. And so that I don't have an answer to that, because I think it takes, uh, obviously, it's going to take negotiations and a, an improvement of relations. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, it's going to take a regional effort to, to calm the temperature down right now and certainly to improve, uh, you know, life in between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And that we're talking decades that have been attempted to do this and it's, it hasn't worked yet. Uh, we've seen some small improvements, you know, the, the agreements with uh, Egypt and the Sinai position and things like that in the past. And um, the Camp David, you know, peace agreements, but uh, it's it's going to take time and 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 a military solution to a humanitarian crisis. I don't think it's going to always work, and it's not working. Well, uh, you that's, know, my, that's, that's that's my long answer. My short answer is time is not on our side now. Um, CNN just reported before we came on the air is that. Uh, two of the hostages have been found dead. Uh, it was a family of five that were kidnapped, and the granddaughter and the grandmother uh, have been found murdered. And so now that you have reports of hostages uh, dead in, in the Gaza area, that just upped the ante for Israel to take action. Also, they keep firing rockets into Israel from Gaza. Today, they resumed in great numbers. So, Gene, but let me, let me go back to... Uh, you know, the, the four points, the possibility of a negotiated result. You know, Israel's had, you know, what, five wars um, since uh, 1948. And in each case, it was attacked. And, uh, and then there have been resolutions of those five wars, one way or the other, where there was a truce or some sort of, you know, peace. Um, and in each case, what it gave up uh, was peric. What I mean is, um, you know, for example, you give up Gaza, and you're supposed to get peace. There was never peace. This is how, what is the third Gaza war already in only the past generation or so. Um, so how can Israel protect its borders in the event of a negotiated peace, if at all? Before this attack by jihadists on Israel, there was a process of normalization occurring in which there was an acceleration of peaceful agreements between Israel and its neighbors. We were facing, uh, at that time, uh, an incipient agreement with Saudi Arabia, which represents all of the Sunni world uh, in Islam. Islam is split right now between Shia and Sunni. And we can exploit that for peace. Israel can exploit that for peace because Saudi Arabia has concern about the growing power of Iran. So. It makes sense maybe for Mohammed bin Salman to um, make peace with, with Israel. Secondly, um, and we need, we need not lose sight of the, um, 
of the of what has happened that is good. Netanyahu is very unpopular right now in Israel. Gershom Gorenberg, who uh, is an American who made Aliyah to Israel about 20 years ago, told me then that uh, the election of Netanyahu was not a good sign because he's a hardliner and he supports the settlements and the West Bank is is under all kinds of pressures and and this new generation is forming new terrorist groups to combat. It's asymmetrical warfare on the West Bank. Um, and, and Israel, you know, needs a new regime in power with new objectives and needs to reach out to partners for peace. The spirit of the Oslo agreements is still, um, is still part of the Abrahamic Accords and normalization can proceed. But jihadists want to disrupt that. That was a major, major of terrorist objective. And these are not your ordinary, even original Hamas people. These are more like Al Qaeda. They have the support of Al Qaeda in Somalia, in the Indian subcontinent right now. They're forming agreements with Al Qaeda. Shia and Sunni terrorist groups are getting together for the first time since ISIS. Um, so, it really is kind of a fractured situation where you have this terrorists against states like Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia who want a peaceful solution for all of their people. And also between the Gazans who are, many of them are ordinary Muslims who don't subscribe to the extreme genocidal and martyrdom concepts of the Hamas militants that are holding them hostage as well as the Israelis hostage. It's a complicated situation. Yeah, how, how, uh, how, how confident are you, Tim, this will be resolved in an amicable way? Um, what's your level of um, optimism or pessimism? Uh, after Joe Biden's trip, which had you know positive implications for sure, and, and not only there, but here. Um, what are your thoughts about the future? Well, I think on the short term, it's going to continue to get worse. I think in the, the near term, it will cool down. And in the long term, I hate to say it, I think it's just the quagmire we've been in for 50 some odd years in the Middle East. Um, I, I, I had a question for Gene and, and this, this alliance that was being forged between Saudi Arabia, the United States and Israel. Uh, to what degree, Gene, do you think that was a, a motivating factor for Hamas to attack Israel? Well, you know, the plans for this attack have been in place since May of 2021. The Abraham Accords have been proceeding, but I don't think at the time Hamas considered this, they were thinking of such wider causes for their terrorist attack. I think they were looking at the fact that the Al-Aqsa Mosque had been um, trespassed on again by hardline Israeli types. And anytime you mess with Al-Aqsa Mosque, you're gonna have a blowback from uh, Palestinians because it's a sacred issue. The sacred ground and sacred issues, sacrilege is different from just ordinary uh, grievances and crimes. And it, it it's like a trigger point. But I do think now and in the final planning stages, they, they are very, very concerned to disrupt the normalization process and the Abraham Accords and the Oslo peace process because they see that these states like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Egypt are putting the Palestinians on the back burner. And this is say, like a, you know, like a kid in a class who's being ignored and has a grievance wants to come to the attention of everybody's going to act out like a juvenile delinquent. Mm -hmm. mm. Almost out of time. Gene, let me ask you this. Um, what's your level of um, confidence that a solution, an amicable solution will be reached? Um, what's your level of pessimism or optimism, um, not only for the solution of this current conflagration, but also for the continuation of the state of Israel? I think one of the negotiating factors could be that the current Israeli government stepped down. 
and a new government be put in place. Secondly, I think Israel has to take a hit. It was defeated by a surprise attack. It was caught unawares. And Netanyahu's regime is being blamed for that. And I will remind you that even Golda Meir had to step down after the 1973 war. This normally takes place afterward, but it could be a negotiated point. Thirdly, mm. thirdly is, uh, Israel's going to have to give up prisoners. They're going to have to take the hit because they suffered a defeat. And fourthly, I don't think the IDF is going to stand down. I think they're going to go into Gaza at some point, and they're going to uh, try to root out this jihadist factor in, in uh, Hamas because there's no going forward when the jihadists are, are in, in control of two million people and, and holding them hostage while Israel is trying to contain the situation and is creating a situation that has blowback with Palestinians throughout the world, claiming that Israel is imprisoning them is, as an apartheid regime, is doing all these things and bringing them up before the criminal court. So I think very, very pragmatic and tough things have to take place. And yes, the idea has to go in there at some point. But in the meantime, what's not being done by Israel, even more so than it should be done, it should be working with Egypt and Jordan to ameliorate the condition of the Gazans who are suffering, who have evacuated Gaza and at Gaza City. And they have to be very, very careful how they use force in this. It has to somehow be part of a larger process with other parties involved, including the United States, for bringing peace back to this situation. I'll add a point, see if you agree. Israel has to get much sharper on public relations. They have to have, you know, primacy in their narrative, which they really haven't had. Uh, I think they operate on the assumption that, that people will read and think and find the truth but it doesn't really work that way in today's world. You have to present the truth and you have to present it in all media, especially social media, and you have to keep on presenting it. Israel should learn to do that better. Don't you agree? Unfortunately, the time for reflection is after, not during. Right now, Israel has to secure its borders, protect itself. It's still being attacked by rockets and it's still suffering from very bad PR right now at the moment. And its yeah. hostages are at risk. <clears throat> uh, Gene Rosenfeld has two articles on our website. You can look them up and read them. Um, and they're under articles and blogs in the, in the top menu of our website. And there'll be more, I hope, looking forward to that. Tim, you get the last chance. Uh, what are your closing thoughts? Closing thought is that Israel can stop the miss incoming missiles, uh, regardless of where they're coming from. Uh, hopefully this does not expand from the other countries. Uh, these missiles came from Yemen this morning, uh, that that stops. And um, the four principles that Gene outlined are, are followed. And that leads to a, a cooling of tempers, so to speak, of emotions. And that um, Gene's right um, that this current administration probably should step down and, and allow a coalition uh, government in Israel to replace it. And all things considered, the United States should try to hold on to Joe Biden because of the players on the platform, he is the best suited um, to deal with this on behalf of the United States. Uh, thank you, Gene Rosenfeld. Thank you, Tim Epichella. Aloha. 